CNN's Van Jones and Scott Jennings. Uh, Van, let me start with you. The biggest case before the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, since Bush v. Gore uh, in 2000. Um, what is at stake politically with this case? Well, listen, um, I think beyond just, you know, uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, what's at stake is the validity of our constitutional system. People have been all morning been banging my head against the table talking about democracy. We have a constitutional democracy because the framers recognize that crazy people can be popular, bad people can be popular. So our constitution says certain people can't serve. People love ALC in my party. She's 34 years old. No matter how much the democracy wants her to be president, she's too young. Uh, people love Harry Styles. People love Paul McCartney. People love Arnold Schwarzenegger. They're popular, but the Constitution says they're not natural-born citizens. You cannot be president. And the framers of these amendments understood traitors can be popular. People who took a, an, er, an oath and threw it in a garbage can can be popular, but you can't be president. So we, we're, in, we're, we're facing a situation now where a big part of our Constitution could become a dead letter because people are afraid to put uh, to, to, to do what the Constitution says, which is to say this guy is no longer eligible. And so the politics now, not just for uh, a, a Biden or a Trump, but for the stability of this country, is on the line today. Scott, what does it mean for the Republican Party if the U.S. Supreme Court were to rule that, no, Trump is not eligible to be on the ballot? Well, I mean, it would be like the end of the original Ghostbusters movie, but in every state capitol and every county clerk's office in America. I mean, I think the Republican Party would, would candidly ignore it. I think they would try to nominate him anyway, and I think uh, Republican-run states would try to put him on the ballot anyway, and I think there'd be massive write-in campaigns to elect him anyway in places where he wasn't on the ballot. And, of course, I don't have to tell you what kind of crisis that would <laughs> create in terms of counting votes and sending up electors and so on and so forth. So I think the political reality is, is that taking him off the ballot uh, would cause a meltdown in this country that it would be hard for us to even describe what would occur in the aftermath. I don't think they're going to do that, but I don't think the Republicans are interested in uh, the Supreme Court uh, telling them who they can and can't nominate. And I, I think a crisis would, frankly, ensue at the highest levels of this party. Appreciate the uh, relevant uh, pop culture reference with the first <laughs> Ghostbusters movie, as if we weren't dating ourselves with the Bush v. Gore references. Van, uh, Trump's legal team in a brief uh, filed on Monday said today, uh, said, quote, um, he is the presumptive Republican nominee and the leading candidate for president of the United States. The American people, not courts or election officials, should choose the next president of the United States, unquote. So Trump's team is arguing there that democracy depends on him being on the ballot so the American people can make the decision, not judges. What's your response to that? The, well, and that's what I was trying to talk about. We have a constitutional democracy. Um, certain people are not eligible to be president. They're too young. They weren't born here. They're traitors. And that's really what's at stake. And by the way, can we just be honest here? If Barack Obama had sent 10,000 Black Lives Matter protesters to destroy a, a session of a joint session of Congress, he wouldn't be in jail. He'd be at Guantanamo, and nobody would be talking about him being president. If Rashida Tlaib sent 10,000 Muslims to tear up Congress during the middle of the joint session of, co of Congress, she would be, be at Guantanamo. And no, nobody would even blink to say she's not qualified to be president. Uh, there's something crazy going on where we act like something that happened didn't happen and has no relevance to what's going on today. Uh, if there's ever been a president who took the oath of office and threw it in the garbage can, it was Donald Trump uh, in the middle of that insurrection. If, if, if you're going to say the, if you're going to say you're a constitutional conservative, then show it today and stick up for the Constitution. All right, Scott, you want to get you want to react to that? Well, I mean, he wasn't charged with insurrection. I mean, that, at the end of the day, the fact that Jack Smith, who investigated this, did not charge him with insurrection, to me, has always been the strongest argument about why they shouldn't throw him off the ballot because of insurrection. All right. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much, Van. And Scott, now to two opposing views on the legal merits of the Trump ballot ban. Conservative lawyer George Conway is back with us, along with Jim Schultz, a former associate White House counsel under President Trump. Uh, Jim, let me start with you. What do you think is Trump's strongest argument today on why he should not be disqualified? So there are going to be three arguments that are going to be made that I think that well, one is straight up that, 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 that he, is, he does not, it doesn't apply to the President of the United States. The argument there is that there are certain folks that are enumerated, and even when they were debating this, when this was passed, they actually had president and vice president in the legislation, and they took it out. And typically, when, you, when legislation is passed like this and you enumerate certain offices, the top office holders first. Here, they started with the Senate, they went to the House, they went to the, 
um, presidential electors. They went to the state officials. They walked all the way down the line, and then they used and, and they used a catch-all phrase in between. The question is, does the president fit into the catch-all phrase? And the argument there is, no, he doesn't. He, he doesn't fit into that catch-all phrase. I think that you're going to hear that today, number one. Well, let me, you know, let's just break this down to make it easily digestible for, for our viewers. Let's come back to you. Respond to that, if you Well, would. the answer is that there's a lot of history that shows that people understood the president of the United States to be an officer of the United States, and especially around the time of Reconstruction. And the answer to the question of whether you take out president and vice president, the reason why you take it out is because it's unnecessary, because they are both officers of the United States. So once you've got them covered by officers, it doesn't matter. And then you have people, when they refer to members of Congress, well, that's a little different because they're not considered to be officers of the United States. So there's a perfectly good reason. And in fact, there's also a there's a uh, discussion, I think, on the floor of, of one of the houses of Congress about, well, what doesn't this apply to the president? And the answer is, oh, yes, it is. He's an officer of the United States. And it would be really, really bizarre to apply this provision to everybody except the person charged with executing the laws. Okay, point two. So point two you're gonna, is going to be whether this, is, this needs to be, this is a self-executing document. It was interesting to hear from Van Jones about the 35 years old, the qualification there. That's self-executing. There's an argument here that it's not self-executing. This is what you're going to hear from the Trump team, is that this, there has to be some other act of Congress. The argument will be that, yes, Congress acted. They passed the Insurrection Act. And when they passed the Insurrection Act, that directly applies here. Here, the president wasn't charged with insurrection. Jack Smith had an opportunity to do it. He didn't do it. And, and in this case, so now you leave it up to state courts or state officials or partisan officials to willy-nilly make that determination. This isn't just about Donald Trump. They're going to argue that this is going to be more about, okay, could, for instance, the border crisis, right? Joe Biden isn't sufficiently supporting the border crisis. crisis. You have a Republican governor in Texas who says, you know, we want to, their officials are going to strike Joe Biden from the ballot because they're allowing, and this is not out of the ordinary, you have a, gov a governor in Texas who could make, who would make this argument given kind of the stances that he's taken on the border, that, they're, that Joe Biden is allowing for some type of invasion into the United States. And, um, you know, Bill Barr made that argument in his brief that this just kind of opens up the door for willy-nilly for state officials to be able to make these determinations without having, you know, a, a federal case brought or a criminal case brought where the, where the defendant faces charges. And the answer to that is that Congress could have said that con the, the con the, the, the the Constitution could have said, section, uh, section 3 of the 14th Amendment could have said that Congress needs to enact legislation. Instead, it only says in Section 5 of the 14th Amendment that Congre Congress may enact legislation. And that applies to all the provisions of Section of, of the 14th Amendment, including Section 1, which contains the Equal Protection Clause, which prohibits race discrimination. So if the argument that the provisions of Section 4 of the 14th Amendment were, were not self-executing, that would mean Congress could repeal the Civil Rights Acts tomorrow.